So now let's get into the nitty gritty of that. If you've been listening to these audios from the beginning, at the beginning, about episode four, we were going through the legacy of good deeds. And the basic legacy of good deeds is that you come to the end of your life and you realize you wasted your life because all the good deeds you did get undone at best or didn't do any good at worst. And um, for the most part, you did it to get approbation, your own and those around you, and you didn't even get that. So all you get at the end is the conqueror worm and you die realizing that all that you sought to accomplish didn't work. Why? You got praised for it. You did some things that really mattered. Like Stilicho, he saved Rome. Belisarius, he saved Rome. Julius Caesar, he saved Rome. In fact, there wouldn't have been a Stilicho and a Belisarius to save Rome from her emperors because they were a really incompetent group. There wouldn't have been those guys if there hadn't been Julius Caesar first. Yeah, what did Julius Caesar get for it? A lot of jealousy and he finally got murdered at the end. You can look pretty much anywhere else you want to look. Anybody who you consider admirable. And ask yourself, really, what good did they do? Their names are, you know, talked about. Some people get all anal about what kind of personal life those people had. But really, you know, maybe during their lifetime for a few years, there was some benefit. But shortly after they died, or even during their lifetime, everything goes back to the same old sixes and sevens. People really don't learn. The work that you do never really lasts. It's talked about. Okay, but you're dead. So what? And, you know, I'm I'm just sort of snipping the highlights of the good deeds legacy you can you can look into anybody's life and say oh that person you know really did something that mattered yeah and it really didn't do any good in the long run they might have done a little bit of good for a little while and then something either came in and wrecked it or it got forgotten about or something else went wrong the amount of work that the person put in for sure did not reap the benefit that should have gone with it the person didn't get the reward that they deserved for the work that they did in every case the most they get is a little bit of you know praise that's mouthed or a moment of silence You know, oh, this is Martin Luther King Day. Okay, whatever good Martin Luther King might have done, he's dead now. And the problems that he sought to undo are still there. So he didn't accomplish what he wanted. And the most he gets is his name on a day. Whoopee. I'm I'm not trying to disparage the man. I'm trying to show the futility of good deeds. They don't do any good for anybody. Even if they're intended with the best of intentions. The human race just can't absorb it. They don't learn. That's good deeds. It accomplishes nothing. A lot of frustration at the end of your life. You fool yourself into thinking that it accomplished something. So right there, Satan's argument is shot down. It's Satan's world down here. He's the one who controls it. 
If he's after doing good and having that be credited to God, honey, it ain't working. Human race is malleable by Satan. We all echo his arguments every day. Okay? So after 2,000 years, really more than that, 6,000 years, including Adam's fall, Adam fell about 6,000 years ago. Satan's had 6,000 years to make his ideas work out. And we're very, very susceptible. He can make us do whatever he wants. He and his demon boys are constantly active trying to do just that. And it doesn't work. Now you can say, well, it's faulty material. But they can indwell anybody they want. Most of the world is, you know, unsaved. Demon can't indwell a believer. There aren't very many believers. You can't blame us for it not working. And most of us are in Satan's camp anyhow, busy doing what he wants. So, it's got to be that his system doesn't work. Because 99% of the human race is desperately obeying him. And you say, well, there's still murder and gross sin and all that. Oh, you don't think he sponsors that? He sponsors gross sin in order to make the other kind of sin that he wants you to get into look better. If he didn't have the dark side, that's good cop, bad cop play. If he didn't have the dark side, then the side he wants you to be on wouldn't look so good because it never works and mankind is not too keen on being ascetic which is basically what his system you know is aimed at if you're going to be a good deeder you pretty much end up being ascetic okay well it don't work so we looked at the good deed side starting out relatively early on to show that it's futile it doesn't do anything for you it doesn't do anything for the human race it only has this hallucinatory semblance of doing good for a short time because everybody says oh this is good so we're all busy praising it but we're not looking at the actual effects and the actual effects are ineffectual or even worse harmful See, if you inculcate people with the idea of good deeds, you end up getting a Linux or a Windows 8 where the programmers have to protect you from yourself. That's Brave New World. That's 1984. Whoever thought it would come in a computer program. You can't even have dominance over a machine you own and buy. You have to be protected from yourself. But then you can't use the machine the way you want. Liberalism in government is in the same track of mind. Oh, well, you can't do this and you can't do that for the benefit of the whole. Oh, we have to protect society. We have to protect you from yourself. You're not allowed to be poor. You have to go on welfare. So then you can't actually learn the lessons that you need to learn so you can get out of being poor yourself. So then you're not allowed to do good for yourself. Oh, we're going to do it for you. But I thought that was the problem in the trial. God is busy wanting to do it for you. Only you get to choose it. He doesn't force himself on you. And in Satan's plan, they force the good on you. That's what Satan's all about. Because that's the only way he can make his plan even begin to work. He has to force you, finagle you, manipulate you, propagandize you, seduce you into what he calls good, which is based on self-approbation and the approbation of others. He has to entice you into his idea of good. 
I didn't get any good done at all. So how good is that? I mean, basically what that ends up meaning is that good, by Satan's definition in the world, has to be tyrannical. You have to constantly manipulate behavior. You have to constantly browbeat the behavior you don't want and praise the behavior you do want to herd everybody into your brand of good. That's the good deed side. So what good is it? Tyranny. You come to the end of your life and you realize you accomplished nothing. Constant frustration. Constant Brave New World 1984 urging you to do more and more and more by manufacturing fake crusades. You know, in 1984, there was this perpetual war between East and West. That was a manufactured war so that that would spur the consumers in their hate week to go on and produce more. You know, that's what, you know, Soviet Union was based on for a long time, too. Hating the West in order to spur on the worker to do more production, which was based on you know, a five-year plan, a this-year plan, another year plan, and everything that you did wasn't good enough. And by the way, you never got any profit for what you did. No, you were just supposed to sacrifice. And so sooner or later, the workers did just did whatever they had to do to get by so they wouldn't get beaten up. Get their little glass of vodka at the end of the day, and that's what they live for. That's what the good deed plan buys. Misery, jealousy, greediness, laziness, incompetence, and above all, self-righteousness. You're self-righteous because you sacrificed. You're self-righteous because you're being tyrannized. You're self-righteous because you're unrequited. You're giving so much and nothing's, you're not getting anything for it. You're self-righteous because you didn't get what you deserved. That's what Satan's plan produces. So how good is it? That's the way human race is. The only time that there ends up being any semblance of happiness is when this whole beating up about being good is slacked off. The more an economy is free, the more a polity is free, the smaller the government, no matter whether it's monarchy or democracy or parliament or whatever you want to call it. It's not the, it's not the format of the government. It's a function of whether the laws provide individual freedom both economically and politically. The more freedom there is in a polity, the more divergence there is between high and low, that's true. But everybody in it is happier. And you say, well, but the poor at the bottom are miserable and nobody's helping them. The poor at the bottom, if you've got a free society, have a way to get out of being poor. And there are a whole bunch of people who are not so poor, who are busy trying to help those poor get out, and it's all free. They're freely choosing to help them. It's not some government imposing on them. Free charity rather than government imposed. Government imposed leads to a mental attitude of entitlement. And the minute you got an entitlement mental attitude, you're talking like Satan, you're thinking like Satan, and quite frankly, the competence and the quality of the work goes way down. If you are, feel entitled and you should get something, then you think whatever work you're doing, you're going to overvalue it. 
and you're not going to do any work because you already feel entitled. So it's teaching the wrong values. So the poor are going to stay poor. And then they become dependent on a government dole, which robs the people who aren't poor of their incentive to work. So then the people who were working have less incentive to work, so now they're going to become poor too, and you got more and more people floating to the bottom through the lack of incentive, and the tax base shrinks. Therefore, the polity eventually goes broke or gets invaded by a more vigorous policy that polity that doesn't have that policy. That's what it's always been. That's how come Athens fell. That's how come Russia fell. That's how come China fell under Mao. That's why there was a Deng Xiaoping in China, because he recognized that, and so he introduced free enterprise again, and now China's thriving. So of the three leaders, Mao, Zhou Enlai, and Deng Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping's idea has proven, you know, met the test of history. The Chinese economy is still, you know, somewhat controlled, not as much, very little comparatively. And of course, politics is still somewhat controlled, but they've all got a lot more freedom now in China than they used to have. And they've, thri they've thrived as a result. Okay? Same thing's happening in Russia. You take off the controls from the government and the polity thrives. We're suffering in the United States because we're becoming more socialistic. We didn't learn from Russia and China. We're going down the road they've already been on. And so, eight years ago, when Obama first took office, Meat was like half the price it is now. Same for gas. I'm not really blaming him. I'm trying to show a trend. Now, I got caught, diverted into politics, but it's the same issue. Satan is saying that people should be micromanaged. That good should be given us from a top-down perspective. Well, that's pretty arbitrary. And now he's doing the very thing, guilt thing he's accusing God of doing. He's accusing God of being top down, just arbitrarily imposing his standard, and he's saying that people are happier under him, measured by what? Okay, so now a bunch of poor people have minimum standard housing and minimum standard. Um, what do you want to call it? Goods. But they're more dependent than ever on the state, which serves the state just fine because the state people who are running the state want to stay in office, and this is what buys them in their office, so they don't care about the poor. But they're doing everything in the name of good for the poor. But it's not the poor they care about. They're just using the money of the state in order to keep themselves in office. Poor are not being helped. They're not getting what they need to get out of poverty. They're getting what they need to stay in poverty. To perpetuate it. Whereas the freer societies have more divergence between poor and rich. And that gives more incentive to the poor and the mechanism because there's no government control for the poor to climb out of being poor because there's more of a, how do you want to call it, step ladders or more variation between high to low. So there's more mobility upward because there is no state control. There is no state control of wages. There is no state control of industry or very little. And because of that, the poor have more mobility upwards. And it's them doing it, not something doing it to them. You see see how Satan's got all God's elements of the plan all kind of convoluted and twisted? God does all the work for us. And Satan says that's arbitrary. But Satan's busy manipulating the human race. 
So he's doing what he accuses God of doing. But Satan's imposing it on the human race. Well, I mean, he's doing it by means of, you know, seduction. So it's not, strictly speaking, an, an impo imposing. He's seducing us into buying this little good deeds plan. But it's always tyrannical. God doesn't seduce us. He tells us the blunt truth and it's not particularly attractive. And then says, do you want it? Believe or burn. The belief part's attractive. The burn part's very unattractive. So unattractive that people don't buy it. So they don't believe in Christ. But they're free to say yes or no. They're totally free. There's no tyranny going on there. The choice is pretty stark. And all you do is say yes. You're not working for it. So why wouldn't you say yes? So where's God twisting your arm? Satan says, oh, you're, you know, bribing them. How? It's believe or burn. The burn is not nice. You've got maximum incentive to say no to the gospel. But saying yes couldn't be easier. So you have a full spectrum choice. There's no tyranny. And then after that, it's the same thing, really. How much Bible do you want to learn? Well, by the way, learning this Bible is going to be kind of a problem because everybody's brother has a different version of it. Everybody's brother argues for it. But you can just ask me who's your pastor and I'll tell you. See, that's like believe or burn. If you don't ask God who's your pastor and you try to find out on yourself, or you try to study it yourself, or you try to do it yourself, you're going to tie yourself up in nuts. That's why it's pan-denominational. It's not based on the denomination. Every denomination, every teacher gets something wrong. Okay, but that's not the issue. The issue is who's the right teacher for you. I can make whatever's wrong straighten out. So that's not the criterion. So then you choose. You choose freely. Do you want to ask God for it or not? He tells you, believe or burn, you choose one or the other. He tells you, ask me for your pride pastor or try to do it yourself. That's just as stark as the gospel. Name your sins to God, well that's like believe or burn. You're naming your sins to God because you're saved now. He paid for it on the cross, but maybe you don't want to grow up in the spiritual life. Maybe you want to hallucinate that you're holy on your own. Or maybe you want to atone for your own sins. Which, of course, is impossible, but you're free to believe that if you want. But he told you what you could do. You can believe or burn. You can use 1 John 1 9 or not. You can ask him who's your right pastor or not. And every single one of those decisions carries, you know, pretty opposite consequences. But it's out there, it's free, it's understandable, it's pretty simply presented in the Bible. And there are a whole lot of people who understand those are the issues. So it's easy to get that information. Uh, everything else about it isn't so easy. And you have to want it. But you're free to not want it. So that's just like a free economy. That's just like a free polity. There is no regulation. There are alternatives. The A versus B, the difference is really stark and obvious. And, you know, if you really want it, it's not easy to go after. And, frankly, even in this life, if you want to make a lot of money... You have to work really hard at it. But even if you work really hard at it, that isn't going to get you success. Success is a combination of, sort of as it were, serendipity and your hard work. And sometimes it's just serendipity. You can be sitting on property that just happens to have a lot of oil on it, and one day there's some black crude coming up, and you're a Beverly Hillbilly now. 
See? There doesn't, there isn't a connection in God's plan. God just sets up a rule. Believe or burn. There's no connection to whether you're a good person or a bad person or what good you do or what bad you do. Do you believe or not? That's it. No connection. Call that arbitrary if you want, but there is no connection. Why? Let's flip that question. What kind of connection ought there to be? Satan says, it ought to be based on how good you are. Really? How good then? No, I'm dead serious. Think about that. Satan's saying that it ought to be based on how good you are. Where do you draw the line? Well, I'm a good person. I should go into heaven. Really? How good? And good at what? Should you be as good at basketball as Michael Jordan? Or at golf? Now, people say he's not that good at golf. I'm not so sure that's true. Is it how good you are at basketball? Well, no, I can't play basketball. Okay, then all the people who can play basketball better than you, they have to get left out? Well, no, the good basketball players should get in. Okay, but you're not a good basketball player, so then I should leave you out. Well, well no, I mean, I'm good at cooking. Okay, so everybody who can cook good gets in. What about people who can't do good, who have no talent to cook? They should be. They should go to hell. Well, you see, where do you draw the line once you start saying good? I have to be good to get into heaven. What I do, I ought to be credited with God. Where do you draw the line? Oh, but an axe murderer shouldn't go to heaven. Why? What made him become an axe murderer in the first place? Do you know? Maybe he was driven to it. Of course, that's a liberal statement, but let's go with that for a bit. An axe murderer shouldn't go to heaven. Why? Well, because he murdered people. Have you never murdered people? Oh, no, I've never murdered anybody. Oh, yeah? Have you ever told a lie about somebody? Because you were feeling a little jealous that day. Well, maybe once or twice. Okay, well then you murdered their reputation. What's worse? To murder the actual life of the person or to murder their reputation so that while they're alive, their life is miserable because of what you lied about. That's a kind of murder, too. And millions and millions of lies are told about people every day. Millions of lies are told about Jesus Christ. Every day. That's just as bad as being an axe murderer, if, if not worse. Because now you're lying about the Son of God. You're lying against His reputation. You're making Him look bad. You're murdering Him in the eyes of others. What kind of penalty should go with that? Should God give you credit or let you into heaven because you lied against the Son of God? And honey, there's not a Christian alive who hasn't done that at least once. I'm, I'm just as guilty of it as anybody. I used to believe things about Christ which I know now are not true. But I didn't have any problem saying those things when I was a baby Christian. 
So I should go to hell then. Because I've committed murder. Where do you draw the line about how good you have to be to get into heaven? What about the paraplegic? Or the person with Tourette syndrome? Or somebody who's autistic? Or who's got, you know, some kind of debilitating disease so he can't do any good at all? It has to be done to him. What about that person? Oh, well, he should get into heaven because he's helpless. Okay, well, but everybody's helpless. Every human being born is helpless. Can you fly to China using your arms? No, you can't even get off the ground if you flap your arms. You're helpless. Can you solve the problems of the world? No. You're helpless. Well, I can do my bit. What is your bit? And why should I, God, credit you, human, for what you do that you call good? Why should I live with you based on the good you do? Are you as good as me? Well, I don't know. I'm not as good as you. Nobody's as good as you, God. Alright, so why should I have that be my standard? Wouldn't I be kind of not God, not truth, basing my standard on what good you do? When you can't be as good as me? That would be unrealistic and unfair to you. Oh, I didn't think about that. Yeah, of course not. Because you're human. You can't think about that. You have an urge that you got when the woman ate the fruit of be good, be good, be good, be good, be good, be good. And so you think you can. And so I ask you again, where do I draw a line? If you have to be good to get into heaven and you think that's important and right, where do I draw the line? Who gets left out? And if you say you're helpless, and you are, everybody's helpless. Every human being is helpless compared to me. So it's not particularly realistic for me to use that as a criterion now, is it? Okay, so end the dialogue there. Let's go back to arbitrary. Doesn't God have to therefore be arbitrary in order for anybody to get into heaven? If you say, well, the axe murderer shouldn't get in, we've already established that there are many kinds of murder. So why the axe murderer and the other murderers get to get in? Can't use that. Everybody's told a lie. So you can't leave out the liars because then you're leaving out everybody. Where are you going to draw a line? So there is no place to draw the line if you're God and you're creating a salvation plan or rule. You can't justifiably use Satan's standard at all. We've already seen the Satan's standard just leads to, leads to misery and tyranny. So it's not just for that reason either. I mean, if you're God and you create, then you obviously want to have a relationship with what you create. And you want them to be happy. Well, Satan's plan doesn't lead to happiness. It leads to tyranny and misery and one-upmanship and no grace. That's the good deeds legacy that we covered back in episode 4. Okay, so what's left? 
It can't be based on anything you do before or after salvation. The whole plan is about having a relationship with God and that plan and that relationship cannot be based on you being good. Because once you make any part of it, even after salvation, based on you being good, where do you draw the line? So doesn't God have to invent a rule that is never based on how good you are? Ever. Not before salvation, not as a criterion for salvation, and not as a criterion after salvation. It has to be totally disconnected. Because the good road is tyrannical and miserable. Even human to human. So, a loving God wouldn't adopt it. If he's fair, he certainly wouldn't adopt it. Because, hello, one person's good versus another person's good. All of it is too low for God. So any criterion he would adopt, any level of good you want to name, is going to be cutting some people out who couldn't do that level of good. So how fair is that? And anybody who's not at that level is going to be really miserable because they're not at that level. Anybody who's at that level is going to be all proud of themselves because they're at that level. Well, but then they're committing a sin of pride. Because nobody does anything on his own. You can't even get up in the morning and shower on your own. Somebody had to make the edifice you live in. Somebody had to make the pipes. Somebody had to make sure the water got into your shower. Somebody has to make sure the water comes out. The shower head has to work. A thousand things done by other people have to work in order for you to be able to do what you do. So you're never, ever doing anything yourself. It's always the product of a lot of other people doing stuff. And what everything they did was a product of a whole lot of other people doing their stuff. So you can basically say when you turn on your shower in the morning, the whole human race was involved in your ability to turn that shower on in the morning. Because we're all interdependent. That's before we even talk about God's existence. And it's because of God you're breathing. So much for you doing anything at all. Yourself. So what kind of standards should God apply? It can't be based at all, at any time. On you doing something good. Can't happen. It can't ever be fair to be, to have that be a standard. Now, in human affairs, we do ha- are interdependent. We do work with each other. And we have to use these ideas about how proficient or how good you are at languages or whatever job you're applying for. We have to use those standards to work with each other. But that's not salvation. That's being able to pull together and collectively do a job. Okay, but salvation isn't a job. A relationship with God isn't a job. It's a relationship. It is a relationship with anybody. Is when two people want to be together. And they can argue all day about the goodness or the badness of the person they have the relationship with. But the fact of the matter is they choose to be with that person or not. That's the way love is. There are a whole bunch of guys that I've known in my life. And they deserved my attention and my love. But I didn't love them. I don't know why. I just didn't. There's nothing wrong with them. You love or you don't love. 
two two girls can look at one guy and one is going to think he's the greatest thing since sliced bread and the other's just no, he's a nice guy okay fine nothing there's no interest guy will marry a gal and everybody else around that gal is going to say well what does he see in her well, but it's what he sees it's his choice See, love is really basically arbitrary. You love or you don't. The object might be worthy of love, but you don't love them. The object might be unworthy of your love, but you love them anyway. Okay, now now multiply that idea a bazillion percent. Because God just flat chooses to love everything. Whether they merit it or not whether there's anything good in them or not. And you can see why. Because if you want to love, why should it matter if the object doesn't measure up? How much love is it if the object has to earn it? I mean, this is the perennial problem. We all know about it. Oh, so-and-so only loves me for my money. Well, then it's not you that the person loves, it's your money. Oh, so-and-so loves me only because I'm good at cooking. Oh, so-and-so loves me only because I, you know, look good. We all hate that. We don't want somebody to love us for some talent we got or money we got or something we can do for them. Well, that always feels dirty and tainted when you know somebody only loves the thing that you give them rather than you. So would we want God to be different? And how much love is it if it's based on that? It's just like doing a good deed in order to get something. Then the good is no good. You're just doing it to get something. So how arbitrary is God then? Not arbitrary at all. And yet, he's totally arbitrary. It can't be based on anything in us. The relationship cannot be based on that. Because once you start going down the road of performance or doing good, where do you draw the line? And then any good you do is never good enough. How many times have you done a job and you were pleased with it for like five minutes and then maybe ten minutes later you found out something you didn't do right? Now all of a sudden the pleasure you got is, you know, lower. Or you just bought something on the internet and it finally arrives and you have all these high hopes for it and you, like a computer or something, and you turn it on and there's something you find out that isn't what you wanted. That really taints the enjoyment of what you bought because it isn't performing the way you wanted. So now you're tied up in knots if you base your relationship to anything in life on performance. Even we humans have that problem. So what? Is God going to be God-worthy? Is God going to be happy if he makes that a criterion? I mean, isn't the ultimate argument about justice is that it should be making happy. Satan's plan doesn't make people happy. It wouldn't matter if they did good or not. They're not happy. You get to the end of your life and you realize it's a waste. It's tyranny and waste. That's what good deeds are. Tyranny and waste. If you love somebody based on performance, it's tyranny and waste. Because the minute the performance is not what you're expecting, then you're disappointed. See, this is where grace is really something much more than grace. It's free love. Love that's free of performance. If you perform or you do something good, that's extra. It's not required. That's the difference. So, look at the irony here. Is God arbitrary? 
Yeah. He better be. Because if he bases his love for me on anything in me, and that's the criterion for him loving me, then he's going to always be disappointed. If I base my love for somebody else on their performance, I'm always going to be disappointed. And if they base their love for me based on performance, they're always going to be disappointed. And we're all going to be miserable together. It'd be better if we were all never born. Grace means freedom from having to perform. That's when real love begins. So, that's how God's plan is based. Believe or burn. Okay, the burn sounds real nasty. Okay, but the believe is real easy. It's not based on your performance. It's based on Christ. And out of love, he went to the cross. That I didn't have to work for that. He didn't go die on the cross for me because of something I was going to do for him. There's nothing I can do for him. He felt like it. That was a unilateral decision on his part to stay on that cross when my sins were imputed to him. I wasn't even born yet. And that's what Romans 5 says. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died on us as a substitute for us. When it says yet sinners, it means that once we're in Christ, meaning once we believe, we're no longer considered sinners even though we are. Because he paid for the sins 2,000 years ago. Because he wanted to. That was a unilateral choice on his part. It was a contract between him and Father. But I wasn't involved in making that contract. God didn't get my consent for him to do that. Now my consent occurs in time to what they chose to unilaterally do in 2,000 years ago. Because I wasn't alive then, but I am alive now, do you believe like we do? I believe in my son's payment. Do you believe in it too? Yes, Dad. Absolutely. Save me. Okay. Now, did I work for that? No. But God doesn't coerce. It's not tyranny like Satan's plan. There's not my works. It was his works. Do I want his works? Yeah. Because why? Because I want him. See the difference? I am totally free to be a putz. I don't want to be a putz. I don't enjoy it. It's not happy to be bad. But between God and me, I don't have to perform. So in the next increment, we'll get into, well, okay, you don't have to perform. Okay, God is not arbitrary, and yet he is arbitrary, because if he's not arbitrary then I can't be saved at all. So therefore, he has to be arbitrary. Okay, but then where's the justice? From the angle of what I become, why was it worth his time? What is he getting for his arbitrary rule that I believe in him to be saved? What's that doing for him? What's that doing for me? What is that doing for the human race? Because that is a justice question. And while Satan's plan very obviously doesn't work, how come God's plan works and how does it work? We'll cover that in the next increment.